It is a pleasure to be back here at CPAC. You know, after my speech here last year, many dishonest Democrats tried to eradicate me from public life entirely. I was very, very glad that they did not succeed at that. I fell afoul of our liberal overlords last year for observing that men can't really become women. I, I stand by the observation. <laughs> I think most people probably agree. <laughs> but what that whole little kerfuffle demonstrated was that America is experiencing an identity crisis. We no longer know who we are. Lots of little errors have led to our present identity crisis, the most obvious being that we no longer have functional borders. Over the past three years, Joe Biden has invited almost six million foreigners into our country illegally. At least three and a half million were apprehended and intentionally released into the country. Another two million or more gotaways were never even apprehended. They all crossed our southern border with the help of criminal cartels. This Democrat-led invasion is the largest human trafficking operation in human history. The vast majority of Americans knows that it's wrong. The vast majority of Americans wants it to come to an end. But we are told that we must tolerate the destruction of our borders and the invasion of our country because we are a nation of immigrants. That slogan reminds me of President Reagan's observation that the trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant, it's just that they know so much that isn't so. As a matter of history, we are not, in fact, a nation of immigrants. Neither that phrase nor that sentiment appears anywhere in our founding documents. The phrase appears virtually nowhere at all until the mid-1960s, coincidentally at precisely the moment that Democrats first imposed a policy of mass migration, because they believed, as they believe today, that doing so would give them a permanent electoral majority. Even so, we are told, we must tolerate this cynical political trick because diversity is our strength. Once again, historically speaking, it's a strange claim. It doesn't come from the founding era, didn't even crop up until in the 1960s, rather. That particular phrase was not coined until 1992 when Vice President Dan Quayle told it to a reporter in Japan. Now, I like Dan Quayle as much as the next guy. But we are not talking about Washington or Lincoln here. The idle musings of George Bush's vice president are not quite Moses delivering the law from Mount Sinai. Wise statesmen and philosophers, anyone with a modicum of common sense, really, have always understood that strength lies not in diversity, but in unity, we are not the divided states of America, at least we're not supposed to be, we're the United States of America. When we face an enemy, we don't endeavor to stand divided, we want to stand united. E pluribus unum. For most of our history, America kept immigration in check. We placed strict limits on it. Not because we don't like immigrants, we like them very much. Some of our best friends and ancestors have been immigrants. But we had always understood, as all wise statesmen have understood, that a country with an unlimited influx of unassimilated foreign people becomes unstable and risks losing its very identity, without which no nation can be any good to anyone. In America's earliest days, Governor John Winthrop called on us to be not a boarding house, but a shining city on a hill, a model of Christian charity for all the other nations of the earth to emulate. This gets to the very heart of our national identity crisis. America was founded to be a model of Christian charity. From the moment that our earliest ancestors boarded the Mayflower, which, by the way, is the name of an excellent new cigar company, Mayflower Cigars, highly recommended. I digress. From the moment our pilgrims stepped foot onto Plymouth Rock, America was founded to be a nation with its eyes on heaven. Francis Scott Key put it perfectly in our national anthem. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. Every American with a penny to his name knows that phrase. All of our great statesmen have believed it. Yet today, 
the liberals want us to believe that America was founded as a secular nation, an atheist nation. They tell us America was founded on a firm separation of church and state. Once again, the problem is not so much ignorance, it's the liberals knowing so much that isn't so. There is no such thing as a total separation of church and state. There never has been and there never can be because states make laws and laws come from morals and morals come from God. Religion is inescapable. It is for all states at all times. That fact has been especially clear in America where we have long been the most religious of any Western nation. Ask the liberals to identify the total separation of church and state in our law. You're going to be waiting a long time <laughs> because they're not going to find it. If they look really closely, they will find that that phrase appears once in a private letter contradicted not only by the public statements of most of our founding fathers, but also by the Federalist Papers, which cite God by name, by the Constitution, which protected the churches established by the individual states, and by the Declaration of Independence, which grounds our entire nation on the fact that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. This is why President John Adams famously warned that our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Some seem to think that's a happy phrase. That's not exactly a happy phrase, <laughs> because what that warning means is that when the people cease to be religious, the Constitution will cease to function. That fact we are seeing around us everywhere today. The decline in religiosity lies at the heart of our national identity crisis, not because of what men have said, but because of who God is. When Moses at the burning bush asked God what he should call him, God responded, I am that I am. God is being. A people that grounds its identity in God will know who and what it is. A people that rejects God, as a wise priest once observed, will only be left with the pathetic question, who am I? The answer is, not much of anything. The decline of religion in America has eroded our identity at every level, from national politics all the way down to the basic unit of society, the family. Marriage, after all, is nothing other than a symbol of God's love for his people. It's no wonder, then, that many people today don't even know what marriage is. Many people today seem to think that marriage can be whatever we want it to be. They sound like Humpty Dumpty, who told Alice in Wonderland that when he uses a word, it means just what he chooses it to mean, neither more nor less. When Alice asks Humpty Dumpty whether one can really make words mean so many different things, Humpty Dumpty responds, the question is which is to be master. That's all. I think this might be the first time that Humpty Dumpty has ever been quoted at CPAC. But this is precisely the way the liberals think. They really believe that they are masters of the universe. They think they're gods who can create the world anew through the power of their words. But they aren't, and they can't. They can't really turn men into women. They can't really turn a couple of men or a couple of women or three men and a billy goat, for that matter, into a marriage. That's just not what marriage is. No disrespect is intended to anyone. Some people don't want to get married. Okay, there's no obligation. But marriage has a meaning. Marriage is and always has been the union of a man and a woman ordered toward the procreation and education of children. If you don't like that, don't blame me. <laughs> I didn't set the rules. It wasn't the mean old conservatives who did this. We did not invent marriage. Marriage is a natural institution. It just is what it is. The left will slander us as hateful for observing this fact. There's nothing hateful about it. There's nothing hateful about reality. Quite the opposite, actually. Truth sets us free. I'll tell you what's hateful. What's hateful is to lie and to force other people to live according to lies. Liberals can rewrite the definition of any word they please, but they can't make men give birth. They can't. Ultimately, they can't change reality. Just won't happen. So they tell more lies. They claim today that individuals have a right to a child. 
But of course, no one can ever have the right to a child because children are people. And no one has the right to another person because those people have rights themselves. In our national identity crisis, we no longer recognize those rights. We no longer recognize people. Increasingly, we treat people as objects. We treat children as commodities to be bought and sold, designer babies to be purchased on the open market of the surrogacy industry so that adults can live out their fantasies. But those fantasies come at a cost. They come at the cost of creating children intentionally to deprive them of their natural mothers and fathers. It's ghastly, but it's to be expected. We are talking about people who claim the right to kill babies when the babies are inconvenient. If we have the right to kill babies, surely we have the right to buy and sell them too. If we have the right to give and take innocent human life, then we have the right to do anything. We are as free as God himself. But we aren't God. And increasingly, we aren't free. We are less free today than we've ever been in this country. Because there's no such thing as freedom without limits. Everything in this life comes with a trade-off. It comes at a cost. People gain the freedom to get rid of babies that they don't want. The cost is that babies lose the freedom to live. Men gain the freedom to use the women's bathroom. Women lose the freedom to have their own bathrooms. Foreigners gain the freedom to enter our country as they please. Americans lose the freedom to make our own laws. Drug addicts gain the freedom to shoot fentanyl on the streets of the city. Citizens lose the freedom to walk down their sidewalks in safety and peace. The freedom liberals offer is the dubious freedom of the drug addict. It's the freedom to follow our lowest appetites, to deny our reason, and ultimately to destroy ourselves. It's the freedom of Satan in Paradise Lost to make a hell of heaven and a heaven of hell. It's the freedom of abject slavery, and it has made a hell of our country everywhere it's taken hold. The freedom the liberals promise is liberation from all limits, liberation from borders, from laws, standards, norms, family, even from biology. It's a false freedom, a siren song. To liberate a nation from its borders is to erase the nation. To liberate a people from its family and its laws and its customs is to erase the people. To liberate a man from his body is to kill the man. True freedom is not the license to languish alone in ever stranger fantasies, but rather the right to flourish, all of us together, in reality. True freedom, to borrow another phrase from St. Ronald, is a national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right. How do we know what's morally right? Because we have brains. Even the liberals, I'm pretty sure, I'm not totally positive, but I'm pretty sure at least most of them do. We have reason and we have moral conscience. We know the difference between truth and falsehood, right and wrong. We know the difference between a man and a woman. We know the difference between an American and everyone else. Our problem is not so much one of confusion as one of cowardice. If we lose our national identity, the fault will lie with our refusal to acknowledge our convictions and to act on them. Governor Bradford tells us that the earliest Americans faced a similar crisis of identity. So they left a world of charming comforts and false freedom because they knew pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. Our forebears knew who they were. The moment we once again follow in their footsteps is the moment we will remember who we are, too. Thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.